unsecured debt can be terminated debts can be purged using the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Credit history can be restored by using the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Creditors can be defended against with knowledge of simple contract law, generally accepted accounting principles, rules of court and the basis that banks do not loan anything. Debt collectors can be defended against with the basis that an assignee cannot establish any contractual nexus to enforce a claim. Banks are prohibited from loaning. They can't loan other depositors money because of the matching principle under GAAP. They can't loan out nor risk any of their own assets because of Federal Reserve regulations. In order to accept a credit application or promissory note, the banks must convert the customer's note into a check and give it back to him. Only they can do this because they have a monopoly on negotiable instruments. It is the customer who creates the currency and funds the line of credit to himself. The customer is the depositor. The banks conceal this fact by carrying out what appears to be a loan approval process for each customer. There is no loan from the bank. The object in defending yourself against a creditor that has not assigned the account to a debt collector is to manipulate the creditor into a new agreement and or force the account into collections. The creditor can be sent a notice of final payment with the expectation that the creditor will not dispute the payment or its terms in writing, thereby accepting it as payment in full. When the final payment is accepted, and the creditor has failed to respond or object to the notice of final payment, it makes it very difficult for them to maintain a claim against the account holder. In practice, the creditor will call you to ask about late payments. It is prudent to take a record of the caller's name, company, mailing address, and phone and fax numbers, date and time of call, and then request that the caller limit communications with you only to writing. It is best to disconnect the call after obtaining this information and then to send a written correspondence making the same request. If the calls continue, you can do this again or make a complaint with your state's attorney general's office. In most cases, the creditor will assign the account to collections. Once this happens, the third-party collection efforts are regulated under the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. The debt can be assigned, but that doesn't automatically mean that you have a contract with the new third-party debt collector, in fact you don't as long as you don't contract with them by acquiescence. The third-party assignee usually has no agreement with the debtor, so in order to recover the loss that it chose to incur, it needs the debtor's consent. This is usually obtained by deceit, by tricking the debtor into accepting a new obligation. You can request from them a validation of the purported debt. This they're not going to be able to fully respond to, the collector never provided any services or products, neither is there an automatic obligation for you to pay. When the collector responds with anything but some written agreement, evidence of your consent or evidence of consideration, they have failed to validate. Most collectors who receive this request will never pursue the collection. If the collector persists in ignoring your request for validation, a complaint to the Federal Trade Commission may be appropriate. Just listing the address for the FTC on the second notice is likely to get positive results. The Commerce Game exposed on April 5, 1933, then-President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, under executive order, issued April 5, 1933, declared, all persons are required to deliver on or before May 1, 1933 all gold coin, gold bullion, and gold certificates now owned by them to a Federal Reserve Bank, branch or agency, or to any member bank of the Federal Reserve System. James A. Farley, Postmaster General at that time, required each postmaster in the country to post a copy of the executive order in a conspicuous place within each branch of the post office. On the bottom of the posting was the following, criminal penalties for violation of executive order $10,000 fine or 10 years imprisonment, or both, as provided in section 9 of the order section 9 of the order reads as follows, whosoever willfully violates any provisions of this executive order or of these regulations or of any rule, regulation or license issued thereunder may be fined not more than $10,000, or if a natural person, may be imprisoned for not more than 10 years, or both, and any officer, director or agency of any corporation who knowingly participates in any such violation may be punished by a like fine, imprisonment, or both. Note, stated within a written document received September 17, 1997, from the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Legal Counsel, Office of the Deputy Assistant Attorney General, Richard L. 
Schiffen, in response to a FOIA, was the following, a fact that is frequently overlooked is that executive orders and proclamations of the president normally have no direct effect upon private persons or their property and instead, normally constitute only directives or instructions to officers or employees of the federal government. The exception is those cases in which the president is expressly authorized or required by laws enacted by the Congress to issue an executive order or proclamation dealing with the legal rights or obligations of members of the public, such as issuance of selective service regulations, establishment of boards to investigate certain labor disputes, and establishment of quotas or fees with respect to certain imports into this country. Note, IT seems rather obvious that President Franklin D. Roosevelt was not expressly authorized or required to issue an executive order or proclamation demanding the public to relinquish their privately held gold. The order issued by Roosevelt was an undisciplined act of treason. Two months after the executive order, on June 5, 1933, the Senate and House of Representatives, 73d Congress, first session, at 4.30 p.m. approve House Joint Resolution 192, Joint Resolution to suspend the gold standard and abrogate the gold clause, Joint Resolution to assure uniform value to the coins and currencies of the United States. H.J.R. 192 states, in part, that every provision contained in or made with respect to any obligation which purports to give the obligee a right to require payment in gold or a particular kind of coin or currency, or in any amount of money of the United States measured thereby, is declared to be against public policy, and no such provision shall be contained in or made with respect to any obligation hereafter incurred. Every obligation, heretofore or hereafter incurred, whether or not any such provisions is contained therein or made with respect thereto, shall be discharged upon payment, dollar for dollar, in any such coin or currency which at the time of payment is legal tender for public and private debts. H.J.R. 192 goes on to state, as used in this resolution, the term obligation means an obligation, including every obligation of and to the United States, excepting currency, payable in money of the United States, and the term coin or currency, means coin or currency of the United States, including Federal Reserve notes and circulating notes of Federal Reserve Banks and National Banking Associations. H.J.R. 192 superseded public law, replacing it with public policy. This eliminated our ability to pay our debts, allowing only for their discharge. When we use any commercial paper, checks, drafts, warrants, Federal Reserve notes, etc., and accept it as money, we simply pass the unpaid debt attached to the paper onto others, by way of our purchases and transactions. This unpaid debt, under public policy, now carries a public liability for its collection. In other words, all debt is now public. The United States government, in order to provide necessary goods and services, created a commercial bond by pledging the property, labor, life and body of its citizens as payment for the debt. This commercial bond made chattel out of every man, woman and child in the United States. We became nothing more than human resources and collateral for the debt. This was without our knowledge and or our consent. How? It was done through the filing of our birth certificates. The United States government, actually the elected and appointed administrators of government, took certified copies of all our birth certificates and placed them in the United States Department of Commerce. As registered securities. These securities, each of which carries an estimated $1 million dollar value, have been circulated around the world as collateral for loans, entries on the asset side of ledgers, etc., just like any other security. There's just one problem, we didn't authorize it. The United States is a District of Columbia corporation. In Volume 20, Corpus Juris Sec 1785, we find the United States government is a foreign corporation with respect to a state, C. New York Re. Merriam 36 N. De E. 505 S. 0 0.1973, 14 L. Head 287. Since a corporation is a fictitious person, it cannot speak, see, touch, smell, etc., it cannot, by itself, function in the real world. It needs a conduit, a transmitting utility, a liaison of some sort, to connect the fictional person and fictional world in which it exists to the real world. Why is this important? Living people exist in a real world, not a fictional, virtual world. 
but government does exist in a fictional world and can only deal directly with other fictional or virtual persons, agencies, states, etc. In order for a fictional person to deal with real people there must be a connection, a liaison, a go-between. This can be something as simple as a contract. When both the persons, the real and the fictional, agree to the terms of a contract, there is a connection, intercourse, dealings, there is a communication, an exchange. There is business. But there is another way for fictional government to deal with the real man and woman, through the use of a representative, a liaison, the go-between. Who is this go-between, this liaison that connects fictional government to real men and women? It's a government-created shadow, a fictional man or woman with the same name as ours. This person was created by using our birth certificates as the MCO and the state in which we were born as the, the port of entry. This gave fictional government a fictional person with whom to deal directly. This person is a strawman. Straminius homo, Latin, a man of straw, one of no substance, put forward as bail or surety. This definition comes from Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 1421. Following the definition of Straminius Homo in Blacks we find the next word strawman, a front, a third party who is put up in name only to take part in a transaction. Nominal party to a transaction, one who acts as an agent for another for the purposes of taking title to real property and executing whatever documents and instruments the principal may direct. Person who purchases property for another to conceal identity of real purchaser or to accomplish some purpose otherwise not allowed. Webster's Ninth New Collegiate Dictionary defines the term a strawman as, 1, a weak or imaginary opposition set up only to be easily confuted, 2, a person set up to serve as a cover for a usually questionable transaction. The strawman can be summed up as an imaginary, passive stand-in for the real participant, a front, a blind, a person regarded as a non-entity. The strawman is a shadow, a go-between. For quite some time a rather large number of people in this country have known that a man or woman's name, written in all caps, or last name first, does not identify real, living people. Taking this one step further, the rules of grammar for the English language have no provisions for the abbreviation of people's names, i.e., initials are not to be used. As an example, John Adam Smith is correct. Anything else is not correct. Not Smith, John Adam or Smith, John A. or J. Smith or J. A. Smith or John Adam Smith or Smith, John or any other variation. Nothing, other than John Adam Smith identifies the real, living man. All other appellations identify either a deceased man or a fictitious man, such as a corporation or a strawman. Over the years government, through its public school system, has managed to pull the wool over our eyes and keep us ignorant of some very important facts because all facets of the media have an ever-increasing influence in our lives, and because media is controlled, with the issuance of licenses, etc., by government and its agencies, we have slowly and systematically been led to believe that any form appellation of our names is, in fact, still us, as long as the spelling is correct. Wrong. We were never told, with full and open disclosure, what our government officials were planning to do. And why. We were never told that government was a corporation, a fictitious a person. We were never told that government had quietly, almost secretly, created a shadow, a strawman for each and every American, so that government could not only control the people, but also raise an almost unlimited amount of revenue, so it could continue. Not just to exist, but to grow. We were never told that when government deals with the strawman it is not dealing with real, living, men and women. We were never told, openly and clearly, with full disclosure of all the facts, that since June 5, 1933, we have been unable to pay our debts. We were never told that we had been pledged, and our children, and their children, and their children, and on and on, as collateral, mere chattel, for the debt created by government officials who committed treason in doing so. We were never told that they quietly and cleverly changed the rules, even the game itself, and that the world we perceive as real is in fact fictional and it's all for their benefit. We were never told that the strawman, a fictional person, a creature of the state is subject to all the codes, statutes, rules, regulations, ordinances, etc. decreed by government, but that we, the real man and woman, are not. We were never told we were being treated as property, as slaves while living in the land of the free and that we could easily walk away from the fraud. We were never told we were being abused. 
How does that make you feel? There's something else you should know, everything, since June 1933, operates in commerce. Why is this important? Commerce is based on agreement, contract. Government has an implied agreement with the strawman and the strawman is subject to government rule, as we illustrated above. But when we, the real flesh and blood man and woman, step into their process, we become those surety, for the fictional strawman. Reality and fiction are reversed. We then become liable for the debts, liabilities and obligations of the strawman, relinquishing our real character as we stand up for the fictional strawman. So that we can once again place the strawman in the fictional world and ourselves in the real world we must send a non-negotiable a charge back and a non-negotiable e-bill of exchange to the United States Secretary of Treasury, along with a copy of our birth certificate, the evidence, the MCO, of the strawman. By doing this we discharge our portion of the public debt, releasing us, the real man, from the debts, liabilities and obligations of the strawman. Those debts, liabilities and obligations exist in the fictional commercial world of a book entries, on computers and or in paper ledgers. It is a world of digits and notes, not of money and substance. Property of the real man once again becomes tax-exempt and free from levy, as it must be in accord with HJR 192. Sending the non-negotiable charge back in bill of exchange accesses our private exemption account. What is that? Let's go to Title 26 U.S.C. and take a look at Section 163, $1 million limitation, the aggregate amount treated as acquisition indebtedness for any period shall not exceed $1 million, $500,000 in the case of a married individual filing a separate return. This $1 million account is for the strawman, the fictional a person, with the name in all caps and or last name first. It is there for the purpose of making book entries, to move figures, digits, from one side of ledgers to the other. Without constant movement a shark will die and quite ironically, like the shark, there must also be constant movement in commerce, or it too will die. Figures, digits, the entries and ledgers must move from asset side to debit side and back again, or commerce dies. No movement, no commerce. The fictional persona of government can only function in a fictional commercial world, one where there is no real money, only fictional funds. Mere entries, figures, digits. A presentment from fictional government, from traffic citation to criminal charges, is a negative, commercial acclaim against the strawman. This acclaim takes place in the commercial, fictional world of government. Digits a move from one side of your strawman account to the other, or to a different account. This is today's commerce. In the past we have addressed these acclaims by fighting them in court, with one legal process, or another, and failed. We have played the feudal, legalistic, dog and pony show, a very clever distraction, while the commerce game played on. But what if we refused to play dog and pony, and played the commerce game instead? What if we learned how to control the flow and movement of entries, figures and digits, for our own benefit? Is that possible? And if so, how? How can the real man in the real world function in the fictional world in which the commerce game exists? When in commerce do as commerce does, use the Uniform Commercial Code. The UCC-1 financing statement is the one contract in the world that cannot be broken and it's the foundation of the accepted for value process. The power of this document is awesome. Since the private exemption account exists for the strawman, who, until now, has been controlled by government, we can gain control of the strawman by filing a UCC-1 financing statement and activating our private exemption account. By properly filing a UCC-1 financing statement we become the holder in due course of the strawman. By activating the account we gain limited control over the funds in the account. This allows us to also move entries, figures, and digits. For our benefit. This gives us virtual ownership of the government-created entity. So what? What does it all mean? Remember earlier we mentioned that a presentment from government or one of its agents or agencies was a negative commercial claim against the strawman. Remember we told you entries, figures and digits moved from one side of the account to the other, or to a different account. Well now, with the strawman under our control, government has no presumable direct access to the personal exemption account and they also lose their go-between, their liaison, their connection to the real, living man and woman. From now on, when presented with a claim from government, we will agree with it, 
this removes the controversy, and we will accept it for value. By doing this we remove the negative claim against our account and become the holder in due course of the presentment. As holder in due course you can require the sworn testimony of the presenter of the claim and request the account be properly adjusted. It's all business, a commercial undertaking, and the basic procedure is not complicated. In fact, it's fairly simple. We just have to remember a few things, like, this is not a illegal a procedure, we're not playing dog and pony. This is commerce, and we play by the rules of commerce. We accept the claim, become the holder in due course, and challenge whether or not the presenter of the claim had has the proper authority to make the claim in the first place. When they cannot produce the order we request the account be properly adjusted. If they don't adjust the account a request is made for the bookkeeping records showing where the funds in question were assigned. This is done by requesting the fiduciary tax estimate and the fiduciary tax return for this claim. Since the claim has been accepted for value and is prepaid, and our personal exemption account is exempt from levy, the request for the fiduciary tax estimate and the fiduciary tax return is valid because the information is necessary in determining who is delinquent and or is making claims on the account. If there is no record of the fiduciary tax estimate and the fiduciary tax return, we then request the individual tax estimates and individual tax returns to determine if there is any delinquency. If we receive no favorable response to the above requests, we will then file a currency report on the amount claimed assessed against our account and begin the commercial process that will force them to either do what's required or lose everything they own, except for the clothing they are wearing at the time. This is the power of contracts and it should be mentioned, at least this one time, that a contract overrides the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and any other document other than another contract. We should also mention that no process of law dash color of law under present codes, statutes, rules, regulations, ordinances, etc. can operate upon you, no agent and or agency of government can gain jurisdiction over you, without your consent. You are not within their fictional commercial venue. The accepted for value process, however, gives us the ability to deal with them through the use of our transmitting utility go between the strawmen and hold them accountable in their own commercial world for any action they attempt to take against us. Without a proper order, and now we know they're not in possession of such a document, they must leave us alone. Or pay the consequences. Yes, this process is powerful. Yes, it can set us free from government oppression and control. By knowing the difference between our strawman and our more real identity, and behaving accordingly, we gain our proper sovereignty over legal fictions, and the ability to demonstrate freedom, to the delight of the divine in us all. An example of a private administrative process response, John Henry Doe secured party attorney in fact for John Henry DOE copyright C0111, Main Street Eugene, Oregon February 9, 2009 sent certified mail number 7,041687, 0004. 3411-7422 Jackboot Individually and DBA Collection Manager and Credit Company Address City, State Zip Here and After Collectively Referred to as a Respondent, You, Yururi, Alleged Account Hashtag Dear Mr. Boot, This is my timely notice to you and your agents that the above alleged account was disputed and the matter settled in full privately. In accordance with state and federal law, this is your notice to cease and desist any further contact with me in any form unless it is in writing, signed by a living soul, within 10 days' time of the date shown above, and you have delivered to me original, verified documents as specified below proving your claims that, 1. The secured party has granted you permission to trespass on a private matter, 2. The matter was something other than settled in full in a private administrative process. 3. The bookkeeping entries show a loan was made to John Henry DOE copyright from the lender's assets thereby proving the lender took a risk in the alleged loan transaction. For the lender is in possession of original signatures for all transactions including, but not limited to, the original loan agreement and transaction slips. 5. All statements by respondent and or its agents are based on personal knowledge as to the status of the alleged loan. 6. The lender and or the respondent has a registered claim against John Henry DOE copyright. 7. The lender and respondents have strictly adhered to, are and were completely correct and accurate and in compliance with, the principles expressed in the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, hereinafter referred to as FDCPA, in all reporting and all information they provide provided to credit reporting agencies regarding John Henry DOE copyright, 8. Every contact, whether written or telephonic, 
to John Henry DOE copyright by respondent or its agents is in compliance with the principles of the FDCPA. 9. An attempt to collect upon a purported debt without providing proof of claim when demanded by the secured party is in compliance with the state statutes and constitutes a valid claim. 10. Respondent's refusal to return the bill of exchange that was tendered on date constitutes something other than other in exchange for closure and settlement in full of the account. Failure to provide the above verified documentation within 10 days constitutes your agreement that no such evidence exists and your agreement to cease and desist from any further collection activity on said account. Should you fail to verify each claim on a point-by-point -point basis, your silence or failure will constitute your voluntary agreement to send, by certified mail, a cashier's check within 30 days of the date of billing by John Henry DOE copyright in the following amounts. 1. $1,000 for each communication made to John Henry DOE copyright, whether telephonically or in writing, which is not in affidavit form, regarding your unsubstantiated claim. 2. Three times the value of any property, the enjoyment and use of which by John Henry DOE copyright or the secured party is impaired as a result of respondent's actions without having first provided documentation verifying your claim. 3. $5,000 for each transaction initiated by John Henry DOE Copyright where John Henry DOE Copyright has commercial ability is impeded due to you or your agent's adverse credit reporting. 4. Respondent owes John Henry DOE Copyright the amount of dollar amount of your unsubstantiated claim and triple damages. 5. $1,000 for each court appearance John Henry DOE Copyright or the secured party makes in response to respondent's unsubstantiated claims and respondent also voluntarily agrees to 6. Authorize the secured party and John Henry DOE copyright to record a UCC, one both on respondent and insert name individually as debtors to secure the debt owed John Henry DOE copyright, and 7. Prove his claim as a respondent in possession of John Henry DOE copyright as property in an involuntary bankruptcy. Proceeding process. The matter is finally and totally settled. This is a private communication to you in your individual capacity and is intended to effect an out-of-court settlement of this matter. Conduct yourself accordingly. Sincerely, with all rights reserved, Jeff the Man. Check out our packet in our email in the description. Our goal is to assist and support you and your loved ones in any way we can. For more than three decades, we've been collecting valuable resources that can help you overcome any obstacles you may encounter. We're excited to provide you with access to the most up-to-date technology and research that have successfully helped numerous individuals in the past. We're confident that they can do the same for you. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions or concerns. We highly recommend reviewing our information packet, which contains cutting-edge and proven knowledge. We believe that access to this information is important for everyone, and we encourage you to share it with your friends and family.